Not I, but Christ in me. Christ in you. Isn't that fabulous? Isn't that what Christmas is all about? God sent his son, not to stay as a baby, but become this man who died on the cross and rose from the dead. Why? So that God may dwell in you and me. Christ in me. Wow, what a plan of salvation that is. God takes our old life and he gives us his own. Does that make you leap up and down this morning, church? Yes, yes, hallelujah. Good, good, good. Now, let me see. My program has disappeared. Here it is. Here we go. Now, we've got two or three folks taking part now, which is lovely. Chris is going to come and lead us in prayer. Chris, come on up, Chris. Chris is the husband of Courtney. And, of course, they're expecting their first baby very soon. And it's lovely to have Chris with us. Uh, and Courtney will be going to maternity leave very soon, but Chris is going to lead us in prayer this morning. Thank you, dear brother. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you this morning in prayer with humble hearts. We are awed by the knowledge that the Almighty God, who brought heaven and earth into being, is the very same tender, loving God who hears and acknowledges all prayer, no matter how small or silently uttered. Even more incredibly, you became flesh and dwelt among us through your son, Jesus Christ. He, sinless and blameless from the day he left the virgin's womb, bore the burden and punishment for the sins of all humanity. His agonizing death on the cross made it possible for us to dwell eternally with you. Lord, we thank you for this incredible act of sacrifice which you made possible. We pray for our service leaders this morning, for Gordon sharing the service and for the message which Ken will share with us. Empower them with your word. Speak to us through them and may our hearts be open to receive your message. We pray, Lord, that you bless all those attending the service this morning, whether here in person, listening in online, or indeed for any who choose to watch the recorded service later on. We pray also for all those who are unable to be with us this morning, Lord, those who are housebound, those who are ill or self-isolating, or those who are unable to be with us here for any reason. We pray for your healing hand on all those affected physically or mentally, that you might bring them back to us safe and sound. Lord, as we see growing global concern over the recent re-escalation of the COVID-19 pandemic. We pray for our health service and health workers around the world. We pray for the scientists and epidemiologists who work to increase our understanding of the virus and its effects. And we pray for the world's leaders and politicians. The decisions they have to make are not easy ones, Lord, and have far-reaching consequences for many people. Give them wisdom, courage and understanding as they continue to tackle this as best they are able. We pray also for their leadership in the ongoing tensions between NATO and Russia and Ukraine. Help to foster compassion on both sides, Lord, that the situation may be resolved without conflict and without loss of the liberties of the Ukrainian people. We pray for those affected by the deadly tornadoes in the US this week, for those who are killed, that you might bless them with your amazing grace and welcome them back to you with open arms. We pray that you bring comfort and healing to the hearts of those they've left behind and that you may be present among the emergency services who are continuing to respond to the ongoing disaster. We pray also for the nation of Afghanistan and the ongoing humanitarian crisis unfolding there. We pray for your presence among the charities and international organisations and their mission to provide food and water to those who are desperately in need. We pray for the safety of the vulnerable who are unable to defend themselves against the ongoing violence. Be their strength and shield, Lord. Help them to know your power. And finally, Lord, we pray for your blessing on Bethesda's Christmas program over the coming weeks. We pray that we can spread the joy of this season far and wide and loudly proclaim the miracle that you chose to send your only son down to earth to live among us and to save us. 
We pray these things in your son's holy name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Chris. That was a lovely prayer. And now Joanne is going to come and bring our first of two Bible readings this morning. Uh, Joanne Shaw, it's lovely to have uh, Joanne and Neil and Alistair with us this morning. And uh, Joanne is going to come and read to us. Thank you. Good morning. The reading this morning is taken from Matthew chapter 2 and verse 13 to 23. When they had gone, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. Get up, he said. Take the child and his mother and escape to Egypt. Stay there until I tell you, for Herod is going to search for the child to kill him. So he got up, took the child and his mother during the night and left for Egypt, where he stayed until the death of Herod. And so was fulfilled what the Lord had said through the prophet. Out of Egypt I called my son. When Herod realised that he had been outwitted by the Magi, he was furious and he gave orders to kill all the boys in Bethlehem and its vicinity, who were two years old and under, in accordance with the time he had learnt from the Magi. Then what was said through the prophet Jeremiah was fulfilled. A voice is heard in Ramah, weeping and great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children and refusing to be comforted because they are no more. After Herod died, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt and said, Get up, take the child and his mother and go to the land of Israel, for those who were trying to take the child's life are dead. So he got up, took the child and his mother and went to the land of Israel. But when he heard that Archangel Achelus was reigning in Judah in the place of his father Herod, he was afraid to go there. Having been warned in a dream, he withdrew to the district of Galilee, and he went and lived in a town called Nazareth. So was fulfilled what was said through the prophets. He will be called a Nazarene. Thank you. And now Elizabeth is going to come and bring our second Bible reading. Thank you, Elizabeth. Do just come up. Great to have good Bible readers in the church, isn't it? And uh, to hear the word of God read at every service that we conduct. Uh, Another reading that no doubt will tell us more about Joseph. Our second reading reading this morning is from Luke chapter 2, verses 41 to 52. The boy Jesus at the temple. Every year his parents went to Jerusalem for the feast of the Passover. When he was 12 years old, they went up to the feast according to the custom. After the feast was over, while his parents were returning home, the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem but they were not aware of it. Thinking he was in their company, they travelled on for a day. Then they began looking for him among their relatives and friends. When they did not find him, they went back to Jerusalem to look for him. After three days, they found him in the temple courts, sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. Everyone who heard him was amazed at his understanding and his answers. When his parents saw him, they were astonished. His mother said to him, Son, why have you treated us like this? Your father and I have been anxiously searching for you. Why were you searching for me, he asked. Didn't you know I had to be in my father's house? But they did not understand what he was saying to them. Then he went down to Nazareth with them and was obedient to them. But his mother treasured all these things in her heart. And Jesus grew in wisdom and stature and in favour with God and men. Thank you, Elizabeth and Joanne, for these great readings. 
And good to be with you folks here in Bethesda and trust that you folks on Zoom are enjoying the Lord's blessing as we uh, worship him and come to consider his word today. As we approach Christmas, sometimes called Advent, uh, we increasingly move towards the time of the actual birth itself. And often during that, we hear of Mary, the shepherds, the wise men, the innkeeper, the angels, Bethlehem. Not so often about Joseph. And I was on the internet and I just punched in Joseph. And out came the Old Testament Joseph, the one with colored coat fame. And it took me some time before I actually got to Joseph of the New Testament. And the way I managed to do that was Joseph, husband of Mary. And even when we look at the genealogy of Jesus, his ancestors, as we find it in Matthew chapter 1, we find after many unpronounceable names, uh, we come to verse 15, and we get the end of the genealogy, Eliad, the father of Eliezer, Eliezer, the father of Mathan, Mathan, the father of Jacob, and Jacob, the father of of Joseph, the husband of Mary. And Mary was the mother of Jesus, who is called Christ. Now, Joseph, he might have felt just a bit like maybe Andrew, the husband of Elizabeth, or James, the husband of Michelle, or as Chris was introduced this morning, Chris, the husband of Courtney, or you might say, who is Ken? Well, you know Margaret Guthrie. <laughs> the famous, good-looking, brilliant Margaret Guthrie. Well, Ken is her husband. Joseph, the husband of Mary. Now, it's already been made known that I'm going to be speaking about Joseph. But you might wonder who I was talking about uh, if I said, this morning, I spoke to Joseph. Not, not Joseph, the husband of Mary. You might have thought it was Joseph, the local hairdresser. Maybe it would help you if I said, Joseph, the guy on the guitar, or Joseph, even the husband of Sue. But uh, if I were to call him Joe, you would know who I was talking about. And I'm going to use that as an excuse to, you'll be pleased to know, shorten my message. Because I'm going to just speak about Joe and have three points. Because for Joseph, I couldn't think of anything for the other three letters anyway. <laughs> so we're just going to call him Joe for the purpose of remembering what we're talking about. Last Sunday, Gordon spoke about Jesus. Emmanuel, God with us. Imagine God with us as the prophet, the priest, and the king. And last week we read that passage, Matthew chapter 1, 18 through to 25. And when we come to verse 19 of that, we read that because Joseph, Mary's husband, can we move on to number eight, Cami? Joseph's husband was a righteous, or as the authorized version calls it, a just man, and did not want to expose her to public disgrace. He had in mind to divorce her quietly. Joseph was a just man, a decent man. I don't know about you, but sometimes when Margaret and I are watching television at home and it's a bit of drama, I've got to nudge her and say, is this a way back in time or is it now? Are they remembering something? Where are we with time? So excuse me if from time to time we jump about in time today or try to keep it in the correct sequence. But at the very start of the situation, we find Mary and Joseph in love. And in the tradition of the day in Jewish families, they got engaged or committed to each other. And the custom often was 
especially if somebody in the family was going to become a joiner or a carpenter or whatever, they'd build an extra room onto the end of the parent's house and for him and his wife to be later to come into that. And it's likely that Joseph was making such preparations for him and his lovely, pure Mary. But Mary took off from Nazareth for a three-month visit to Judea. And there she was going to visit a close relative called Elizabeth. And when we read about Elizabeth, it says she was well on in years. Those of us that are kind of thinking about these things would maybe say she's getting on a bit. And especially as far as having given up hope of having a baby. But God had done something that humans can't do. God was able to do the absolute impossible and unexpectedly it was found that Elizabeth was going to give birth to a boy. And that boy was going to grow up to be called John the Baptist. And he would take people and baptize them, indicating that they had been repenting of their sins. Luke 18, Jesus said, what is impossible with men is possible with God. We need to remember we have got a big God, if we are trusting in him. And old Elizabeth eventually found that she had a baby boy. And Mary was away there with Elizabeth for the three months, and Joseph was probably looking back, looking forward to her coming back home. This girl that he loved, that he respected, that he was going to marry, find that she came back with child. Mary, his Mary, was pregnant. And Joseph knew he had nothing to do with it. The law of the time was such that a woman in that situation could be stoned to death. That wasn't Joseph's plan. He could easily then have made a big issue of it saying, look, everybody, I'm divorcing her. But no, worried that Joseph was a just man, a good man, a caring man. And he intended to divorce her on the quiet. Joseph certainly was a good man. The bits we read about him in the Bible every time indicate that he was a good man. But Like all other men and women, he wasn't perfect. He too was a sinner. And so was Mary. Mary was an outstanding girl and humble and selfless, willing to do what God wanted. But unlike what some people believe, she too was a sinner. And the Bible tells us we're all in that category. Everyone has sinned and come short of God's standard. The only person who was perfect was Mary's first son, the Lord Jesus Christ. In First John we read, but you know that he, that's Jesus, when he appears, as he appeared at the Christmas time, we continually, I remember, year after year, as he appears, so that he might take away our sin. And in him is no sin. The one who had no sin was going to take away our sin by himself paying the price for your sin and for my sin. Joseph, that just decent man, planned to divorce her quietly, not to make a big issue of it at all. But we read in Matthew 1, verse 20, an angel of the Lord appears to Joseph in a dream to tell him to take Mary home to be his wife. 
This message was saying, Joseph, even if people are kind of laughing at you because your fiance had become pregnant and you keep saying it was nothing to do with you, you have to take her home and she's to be your wife. And Joseph, he carried that through. He followed through and he was maybe thinking, I'm going to look even more stupid, marrying this girl after it. But the angel's message to him was, the conception was caused not by another man, but rather by God, the Holy Spirit. And in addition to that, his name is to be Jesus. Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. And Joseph was a just man who had always intended doing a decent thing. I wonder if, like me, you're challenged a bit by that. Where Joseph didn't go wishing to assert his rights, to make sure that his reputation was kept intact. I wonder just how we are in our relationships with our acquaintances, our neighbors, our family, our spouses, and others. How just, how good, how considerate are we in our dealings with others? Joseph had that dream, and he woke up, and it was some dream. I don't know if it comes with the name Joseph, because the Old Testament Joseph, he was a dreamer too. What about you, Joe? Are you a bit of a dreamer? Yes, Joe. It comes with the name Joseph. But Joseph woke up from his dream, and he recognized that this was a message from God that the angel had brought in the dream. And he took Mary home to be his wife, because Joseph was also an obedient man, even if it caused his reputation in the community some damage, he took Mary home. Verse 25, we read that not only was Mary a virgin when she became pregnant, but Joseph and she refrained from intercourse for the rest of her pregnancy. Gordon was saying how much he admired Joseph and the more I get to know him and about Mary. My admiration for them grows and grows. And then at Luke 2, we find that Joseph and Mary have moved on and they're traveling from Nazareth to Bethlehem. And Mary is about to give birth because there they're going to register so that their taxes could be paid. Looks as if our screens are going to be catching up in a wee while, but that's not a problem. Joseph was obedient to the law of the land, to the government, as far as his taxes were concerned. And I don't know about you, but I have been thinking here, December, January is coming. That terrible tax forms to be filled in sometime in January. And I checked up and thankfully it's at the end of January. But here was Joseph doing the right thing. I wonder if in our dealings, maybe with government or other commitments, we too are like Joseph in doing the right thing. They arrived at Bethlehem and found that the only accommodation available was a stable. I don't know if you managed down to the square yesterday. It was pelting the rain, but the stable was there as arranged by Helmsborough Baptist Church. And complete with the live donkey, there were the children dressed as angels, shepherds, and wise men. And it reminded us of the fact that Joseph and Mary were there in humble circumstances. And it was into these circumstances that Jesus was born. At verses 21 through to 24, we find that Joseph was obedient to the religious law of the time as well. And when the baby was born... There was a circumcision and the consecration of the baby at the temple in Jerusalem. John read Matthew chapter 2 for us and that terrible story of 
the awful King Herod. He had thought they had it sorted out with the wise men that they would come and tell him where this baby was. It's number 22, we're at, guys. And he then realized that they had outwitted him. And he was furious because there was this rumor about this baby that was going to become the king of the Jews. And that was not his plan at all. And so his decision was that all the boys who were two and under in the Bethlehem area were to be killed. And then Joseph had another of these dreams telling him to go with Mary and Jesus to Egypt for safety. That was a fantastic video. I I could have just sat and that would have been fine without my message as it told the story of them going into Egypt and it covered it all very well. And this message said, for safety, you have to take the child and his mother down into Egypt. And being a decent, a just man, Joseph obeyed the message from God. And the birth we celebrate at Christmas of Jesus was in order that 33 years later, he would be our savior because Jesus too was obedient read in Philippians and being found in appearance as a man that was when he became a baby a human baby there in Bethlehem he humbled himself and became obedient to death to death even death on a cross. At Bethlehem, God the Son took on human form and he obeyed the will of God the Father, even to the extent of going through with this plan of salvation that would take him to die on the cross for our sin. What kind of man? is this, that died in agony. We, he who had done no wrong was crucified for me. What kind of man is this who laid aside his throne that I may know the love of God? What kind of man is this? I ask you this morning, do you know this man, Jesus? Do you know him as your saviour? And we'll be thinking later of how much he loved us. I wonder if you love him back. Cami, in the communion service around about 12, 12, 15, is going to be speaking about the cross. And we'll probably sing that hymn. What kind of man is this that died in agony? I wonder to what extent we, you, are obedient to God. Joseph was, the Lord Jesus was. If we are followers of the Lord Jesus or disciples of Jesus or Christians, and we see that we love him, then we should show our love by doing what he asks us to do. Jesus says, if you love me, keep my commandments. 25, that says. If you love me, keep my commandments. And here's a a time shift coming on. We're going to jump away past the birth, death, resurrection of Jesus. And what we find, Peter telling the crowd all about the death of Jesus, burial, the resurrection. And he says that they should Consider that situation. And the response from the people is, what shall we do? Peter replies, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Verse 47, it says, And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. I've heard someone use the label SBA. And it stands for somebody who's saved, 
is baptized and added to the fellowship of God's people. Saved when the people repented of their sins and received the Holy Spirit. They were baptized to indicate that they were obeying the instructions of Jesus and of the scriptures, indicating that they were letting people know by being baptized in water. And we recently had Susan baptized just there, that they are followers of Jesus. I want people to know that I am one of Jesus' people. And then they were added to the Christian fellowship of their time. Back in time again to the time of Jesus. And we read there in Luke chapter 2. Thank you, Elizabeth, for that. And from verse 41, moved on to the time when Jesus became aged 12. And we find Joseph again organizing the annual family trip to Jerusalem to participate in the feast of Passover. Joseph had been engaged to Mary, but he was also engaged with God's people and engaged and committed to the worship of God. And we read that when the Passover events were over, the family set off to go back home. Well, not all the family. The family minus one, because Jesus had stayed behind there in Jerusalem in the temple. And Mary and Joseph had thought, oh, he'll be traveling with some of the other relatives. We're okay. And then they realized, no, we're not okay. He's not here. And so we find that they go back to look for Jesus. And we find that he is there discussing things in the temple with the Jewish leaders and listening to their answers and asking more questions. And everyone is amazed at how much Jesus understood what was going on. And Mary says to Jesus, we've been anxious and we've been searching for you. I wonder if you've ever been in that kind of situation like Mary, where you're responsible for a child or children and they've disappeared somewhere. My children, grandchildren rather, were about age six and I took them to the big shopping centre in East Cobride. And the three of them were usually kind of well-behaved and fairly predictable. However, just about there where you can see near the ice rink, one of them disappeared. And he was away for about 10 minutes. You can imagine me scurrying up that lane, down that lane, looking at that guy, looking for somebody in charge to find my grandson. And you can just, I'm sure, put your own thoughts into mine as what was going on there. Until to my relief, he appeared from behind the door. And he was all smiles. And he thought this was a great joke. But I was so relieved that I didn't immediately let him know how bad a joke it was. <laughs> Jesus says, why would you searching for me? Didn't you know that I had been my father's house? And Mary and Joseph didn't get it immediately. Some, I'm sure, would have thought, his father, his house, a wee back there in Nazareth. What's the score here? But I'm sure Mary certainly got it later on, and maybe Joseph did. As it came as a reminder to him, in my father's house, it was a temple that Jesus was referring to, and it would come again to Joseph. This is a boy that I took a responsibility for. Is not my son biologically but he is in fact the son of God and Mary's boy grew up further from age 12 and became a man and like Joseph he was engaged committed to God's plan John 6 says 
Jesus speaking, for I have come down from heaven, not to do my will, but the will of him who sent me. Jesus' delight was to do the will of his father, and he was obedient to that will. And when the Jewish leaders heard this, they began to grumble, we read at verse 41. And they said, is this not Jesus, the son of Joseph? We know his father and mother. How can he say, I came down from heaven? But that was, in fact, the case. That baby that we think of was God, the son in flesh, came down from heaven. And Jesus showed just how committed he was, not only to the will of God, but to God's people. And those who, like us, many of us who have accepted Jesus as Savior, who are his children of God and the sheep that the good shepherd looks after. At John 10, we read Jesus saying, I am the good shepherd. Commitment, engagement. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. Joseph was engaged and committed to God's people and their worship of God and service to him. Jesus showed his commitment and engagement to God and to his followers by laying down his life when he went to the cross. I wonder to what extent am I, are you committed to God? and his people, and engaged in the worship of God and service of him. It may be that you should be considering committing yourself to membership of a Christian fellowship, possibly this one or others in town. If you're interested, then please speak to Jim Gordon or myself, and we'd love to hear more about it. And so, as we think of Joe, J-O-E, Joseph was a just man. He was obedient to God and he was engaged with God and his community. I trust that each one of us will have put our faith in Jesus. And if not, today is a great day to learn more about Jesus and to give your life to him and put your trust in him. By doing so, we can be justified, not by our good deeds, but justified by the blood that Jesus shed on the cross, we read in Romans chapter 5. Verse 9, it says, much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him, through the Lord Jesus. 38, please. So, As obedient followers of Jesus, maybe that you're thinking about being baptized. Maybe if you love the Lord and his people, you would want to show commitment to a Christian fellowship. This Christmas, you might want to give some thought to Joe. Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom was born Jesus was called the Christ. And if you don't think about Joseph, that's okay. Do think about Jesus, who is called the Christ. Amen.